Today, I would like to conduct a disquisition on abjection, because abjection is very important, but not a lot of people understand what it really means, especially if you would like to become a philosopher or any type of serious intellectual, you must acquaint yourself with the concept of abjection, because frankly, to be a philosopher, one must be abject. And the reason a lot of people don't understand anything about this concept is because most contemporary philosophers want to be respected. They want to be in good standing in society. They want to be accepted, whereas what we should try to be is abjected. Abjection comes from, I believe, the Latin root abjectus, which is pretty much literally the opposite of being accepted. It means being rejected, essentially. So if you think about these terms, reject, eject, deject, what they all basically have in common is being thrown out of something. Abject is very similar. To be abject is to be cast aside, to be thrown astray, set, set off from the group in a kind of oblique way. And that is pretty much an absolute requirement of any kind of serious intellectual life. And it's always been the case historically. There's really no getting around that. If you want to think what other people are unable or unwilling to think, and you want to express it in any way that has any impact at all, then you should expect to be mercilessly, brutally rejected, abjected, rejected, and pretty much thrown out of every possible social standing that is available to people. It's just part of the game, folks. It always has been. So I think what we're seeing now with you know, what is called political correctness or cancel culture or whatever is in some sense just the catching up of digital culture to this basic essential reality, which is always obtained, which is that if you want to say anything that's meaningfully and interestingly and importantly, importantly true, you should expect to be rejected. So that's why this concept of abjection as a kind of ideal, as a historical practice in some sense, with, a, with its own kind of historical self-consciousness, is really worth studying and reflecting on nowadays. Because when you start looking into it, you actually realize that throughout all of history, all of the great, I'll call them intellectuals, but I really mean that in the most general sense of not just thinkers and writers, but also the saints, for instance, the great saints are have always been abject. Great criminals, for instance, also have always been abject. Have always been abject. You know, the criminal and the saint essentially converge. The true intellectual and the artist, and the true political militant. These all, all of these figures tend to converge in a tendency towards abjection, a kind of complete, utter incommensurability, a kind of impossibility of being integrated into contemporary status quo institutions. And that sounds kind of sexy and impressive and cool, but in practice, it's not. In practice, in any particular status quo environment, in any particular epoch, to be a true intellectual or artist or saint or whatever is to suffer. It's to be alone. It's to be isolated. It's for people to hate you, pretty much. And so if you don't have a stomach for that, then you're never going to be an intellectual or a saint or even a great criminal. You're never going to do anything great, probably, to be honest, if you don't have that, not only a tolerance for abjection, but a kind of thirst for abjection. If you want to be a philosopher, you have to cultivate a kind of thirst to be hated, to be spat upon. And if you're not able to cultivate that, then you're probably not going to be able to achieve anything very interesting or significant intellectually. And again, I mean intellectual in the most broad sense. So let's talk a little bit about what abjection involves or what it entails. And if we unpack it a little bit, what, it, what does it mean to be cast aside or to be thrown, thrown out? Well, one thing is in the short term, it means to be disgusting. People will literally find you disgusting. And this can manifest in a number of different ways. It means at a bare minimum, all of the kind of conventional ways people want to be admired are, are basically thrown out the window. Being handsome, being attractive, being, you know, people wanting you to come to their parties, giving you speaking invitations, all these different indices of success or admiration, all of those go out the window. 
you should want all of those things to decrease to zero if what you want is to pursue an intellectual life. And rather, you should actually be expecting people to hate you, to send you various forms of hate, to spit at you, to literally kind of look at you funny. You know, that's, I think, a very telltale symptom of true abjection. People look at you and they actually feel the physiological response of disgust. They step away from you or they look at you like this. That's a good thing if what you want is to be a serious intellectual in in a kind of long run world historical way. So if you're not producing that effect on people, you better start. You better start thinking about how you can become more abject. You must change your life. You really must. And the good thing about this, on the other hand, is you become very hardened to all of the various ways in which different individuals or entities exert social pressure on you. You become anti-fragile, one might even say, because all of the ways in which people usually punish you and try to constrain your behavior, not only are you robust to them, you're unaffected by them, they don't bother you or affect you, but they actually motivate you. They make you feel even more energized and more emboldened because when someone is disgusted by you or is mean to you, if you can actually feel encouragement through that, if you hack your systems and your circuitry in a way that you actually feel positive affect because you realize in this longer term historical way that sort of abjection is positively correlated with with radical truth seeking, if you're able to experience that positive affect from it, then all of a sudden you enter into this new type of nonlinear uh, psychological productive dynamic where the more people hate you, the more you're able to produce, the more insights you're able to glean, the deeper you're able to go into your abject search for whatever form of truth you're after. And so we need to really, I think, celebrate abjection and cultivate it and be a little bit more explicit about it. I want abjection. I desire it. I want to increase my tolerance for the hatred that I'm able to receive. I want people to think I'm ugly. I want people to think I'm stupid. I want people to think I'm gross. And I want to cultivate more and more experiences where I essentially put myself in that position because I really do believe that it's correlated with um, the greatest insights and experiences that we're capable of emotionally and psychologically and intellectually. So that's the purpose of this video is to put that on the agenda, explain what it means a little bit, and call forward other people who are interested in the real subterranean history of radical philosophy or radical politics or radical, even you could call it social activism in a sense, although the truly abject, they, they've, they've written off all of society. They don't care anymore. But in its own weird way, this kind of abjection does have a an effect, a kind of very consistent empirical consequence of having reverberations on the society that, that abjects, um, you know, the the individual under under consideration here so it is in its own weird way a kind of long-term social activism to basically write off all of society to let them to let them eject you into the desert let them abject you into the desert and i want to highlight that and i want to celebrate that and i want to encourage that at least for those of you who have the will for it